remember, Elijah comes on the scene, the north kingdom, they've, the kingdoms have been divided after David's death into a north and south. And we meet Elijah when the eighth king, Ahab, is on the throne of the north kingdom. And I gave you a little bit in my introduction. I wrote a few things on there to kind of give a timeline. Uh, one of the things that God makes it really clear to our life that when Elijah made a choice in his life to run for his life from Jezebel's threats, which were empty, she had no authority or power over the, what she said she would do. Elijah did something really interesting that most people miss. When he started running from God, quote, Jezebel, he was actually running from God. He wasn't running from Jezebel because she was no threat. But she was used as an excuse. Okay? We all lo always look for excuses for not following the Lord in our life. And if you want one, you can always find one. And if you can't find one, you can create one. Just depends how good it is, how great of you are. We certainly learned that from him. Elijah did something really interesting. When he got to Beersheba, he left a young prophet that he was tutoring, that he was mentoring. He left him there. <clears throat> Which is really interesting. Because you don't normally do that. Eh? But he was on the run. And there were a lot of reasons probably in his mind why he left him there. But I tell you, he didn't know. He just left him because maybe like John Mark, it was baggage. They didn't want to hold him up or I'm running. I don't know where I'm going. You need to go back and do, I don't know. We're not told why, but we are told he left him and kept running. And we're going to learn why he left him. And he's going to learn why he left him. But he, he is mentoring a young prophet uh, in his ministry when he leaves him at Beersheba and runs alone. See, up to now, he's been running with a buddy. And Mount Horeb, where he was told to go, Elijah was benched. And Elisha promoted in the plan of God. Elisha was benched, but not kicked off the team. That's really important. It's important in your life to know this. He will, give, he will be given a special assignment of mentoring or preparing Elisha for the position of national prophet in his place. Now, when you read 1 Kings 19, uh, start way, way back up there in about 8 and go through the end of the chapter, you will learn all that. My study today comes from 1 Kings 19. 19, where he talks about meeting Elisha, and now we know why he left the other prophet, because God has another prophet for him to mentor, and he's going to mentor him. And you know what? He's going to men mentor him, Elisha. He's going to mentor him. He he's going to anoint him to the next prophet, and he's going to mentor, mentor him for about 10 to 15 years. We're not quite sure how, somewhere between 10 and 15 years before Elisha, before Elisha becomes the national prophet. He's given a pretty big assignment, but it's one that's behind the scene, not out in the public, but behind. He's going to be a mentor of this next prophet. We, we read that earlier uh, in our last week. We read about that. He said, he said, he gave Elijah a new, at more Horeb, he gave Elijah a new assignment. He said, I want you uh, to anoint the king of uh, Arab, A A A Aram, I want you to uh, uh, anoint the next king. And he gives him by name. Hazael, 
and, and, and uh, Jehu. And then he says, and I want you uh, to anoint uh, Elisha as the next prophet in your place. Yeah, read 15 through 18, you'll see that. So at Mount Horeb, Elijah was benched, and Elisha is promoted in the plan of God. And now we're in a transition period from Elijah to Elisha as the national prophet. I want to tell you four things today about it. And I'm not going to carry the life of Elijah any farther because my purpose was to show you the purpose of Elijah in a nation, I think, is very similar to what we're going through today with COVID. Point number one in my closing study. Elijah was instructed to anoint three new men to lead a spiritual reformation. We read about that in 1 Kings, 15, uh, uh, 1 Kings 19, 15 through 18. But when you read the story of the rest of the life of Elijah, which is going to go through the, to the second chapter of 2 Kings, he only anointed one. He was instructed to anoint three. He only got to anoint one, and that was Elisha. And Elisha will anoint the other two. You can, if you read on in 2 Kings the, through, through the first 10 chapters you would learn all that so I just gave you the clip notes on it Elisha will, will anoint the other two uh, the, the two kings Elisha's family is interesting uh, when you read 1 Kings 19 16 it gives you a, fur, a full description of Elijah's parents and where he's from now what's interesting at least to a guy like me, and probably Ernie. Uh, well, most of you, most of, anybody who likes history, like Don and and other guys in the church. I know a lot of guys in the church like history. Elisha is from the West uh, Manasseh, western side. You know, there's a eastern side and a western side. He's from the eastern side. By the way, so was Elijah. And, and listen, they weren't too far apart from each other growing up. Both from the same. That's like saying they're both from Alabama. And it could be something like, they have to be pretty close. Probably like, Somebody in Birmingham, a Moody, Billy. Somebody like that. Somebody close. Uh, walking, close, you know, you walked. <laughs> now, you didn't have a truck, Billy. You, you, you walked. Elijah, that, so that, I find that kind of interesting. The first two prophets out of five to the North Kingdom that were supposed to get the people to lead a spiritual uh, reformation, none of them could do it. Be interesting to read these other guys. The second Kings is going to talk about the ministry of Elisha. Five prominent national prophets sent by God to lead a spiritual reformation to the North Kingdom. Elijah, Elisha, Jonah, Amos, and Hosea. That is from the eighth king to the 20th king over a period of 150 years. Is not God patient? God is not willing that any perish. 150 years. That's not, that's not long in the eyes of God, as a day is worth a thousand years, but it's a long time in our eyes, isn't it? 150 years. None of these national prophets, however, were able to lead Israel, the North Kingdom, to a spiritual reformation. Stephen tells us why. Stephen. Stephen in the New, T New Testament tells us why. In Acts, the seventh chapter, verse 51, Stephen says, I, I, and I'm just quoting one verse out of 51 through 60, you men were stiff-necked 
and uncircumcised in heart and ears and ears are always and ears that are always resisting the Holy Spirit you are doing just as your fathers did. We get, you know, it's kind of interesting. You get lumped, to get lumped together. Here's the world people, and here's, here's the believers. But even the believers are separated. Here's the world, and here's the church. But even the church is separated. See, did you miss that? As your fathers did? You see, believers are divided into two groups, carnal and spiritual. Those who walk by sight, and those who walk by faith. You see, there's even within the church, there's two groups. You see, you're acting, you're acting. Now we're 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 in the church age and the Jews were acting just like their forefathers, just like, Jew, like they always did. Yeah, just remember, just always pay attention to what group you're in. <laughs> Apparently, he groups them. Point number two, cosmos diabolicus fear. Now, watch this. There, there's a way that you can test it in your life. Now, cosmos is the word for world in the Greek, and diabolics is the word for the devil. And phobos, phobias, that's the word for fear. That's Greek language. When you talk about the cosmos, you're talking about a world system of thinking that's promoted and run by the devil. Diabolicus. That's a satanic system that opposes everything that God stands for, everything the Bible teaches. Always tries to substitute anything that deals with true worship and spiritual growth and activity in the plan of God. Cosmos Diabolicus fear is exactly what Elijah has when he's running. And you say, why are you running uh, why are you running from Jezreel, Jeremiah? Uh, uh, I don't know why I've got Jeremiah on my mind today. Uh, Elijah, why are you running away? Now, his answer would probably be, Jezebel has threatened me. But the truth of the matter, listen, you, if a Christian's running, he should be running the race that's been set before him. And he's running to the goal line because the author and the finisher is going to meet him. It's the one who's been running with you. It'll be there in the finish line with you. The author and finisher. The author, the starter and the finisher. You never run this race alone. Listen, when when you get to that place in your life, when you think you're alone, you're in a bad place to be. You need to grab the word of God and open it to Hebrews 13, 5, where the promise says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. How could you ever be alone? Not only that, you should read first, you should read uh, John 14, 16. The Holy Spirit lives inside your body and he can never leave you. He's there forever. He's called the what? The comforter. He's called the paracletus. He's the comforter. How is it possible that you would be sitting in a, like, like he was, Elijah? He was laying on her, under a juniper tree in a desert in a fetal position asking God to take his life. What a cowardly act. Listen, it's one thing to be there. It's another thing to stay there. Okay? I don't fault you for having despair in your life. But it only should be there for a moment. That's not the true life. That's the world's life. That's not the life in Christ. That's not the abundant life. God didn't save you that 
you could suck on your thumb under a bush somewhere and be in a fetal position praying to die. You should be praying to live and have a great ministry for God. How selfish can you be? Your life is not your own. You've been bought with the prize, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Your life doesn't belong to you. From the day that you got saved, and every time you think your life is yours and you can do what you want to do, you always get in trouble. Come on. It always becomes the worst, and it doesn't get better until you change your whole idea about this in your life. Look. Look, it's okay to be weak. In fact, that's where God wants you, but he wants you to be able to turn in your weakest hour to him because he can empower those who are weak. It's those who think they don't need God that he has trouble with. It's not those who know they need God. Look, you need to read 2 Corinthians 12, 1 through 10. Don't let the devil lie to you. Listen, your life, I don't care what your life was before you met Christ. You were headed to hell with it no matter what it was. Your life began with your salvation. And look, at some point, you've got to take responsibility for it. Take responsibility for it. Walk in the spirit, walk in the, in the, in, walk by faith and walk in the power of the spirit. Get your head in the word. Start, start, start helping people that really need help. Isn't it interesting how God always brings you to people that was like you yesterday? <laughs> so you have a message that there's a tomorrow for their life. Isn't that always interesting? It never brings you anybody while you're sitting in the corner in the fetal position uh, praying for death. Everybody passes by. They're going, uh-uh. What kind of a message could he, well, they don't here and die with me? Cosmos Diabolica's fear in the heart of Elijah has shut down the faith cycle, executing the directive will of God to be a national prophet and lead a national reformation. He's running from one of the most exciting times in his life. God has prepared him for this great moment. His life, oh, will we be without conflict? No, man, you, you, the devil's still out there. Every time you win a victory, you can expect a counterattack. You get one victory in the Lord, the devil's right out your door knocking on you. You're like, oh, you're a slug. You're not worth it. You're not worth it. You're not worth anything, Christ. He's not going to leave you alone on it. You just, you, listen, you've just got to understand that who's talking to you. It's not the spirit of God. It's the spirit of the devil. You, you can't listen to that one. My, my, my. Who am I, who am I talking to today? I'm not talking to anybody. Listen to this. Hebrews 2. Now, listen to me very closely. Hebrews 2. I put it on your paper. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, now watch this, see the word that? You ought to circle that. That through death, that's death on the cross, he might render powerless. Render powerless. Render powerless. The devil. <laughs> what are, listen, why are you running from God? Listen, I want you, to, I want you in your mind, just put, put the cross. Put the cross. Put a cross in your mind. You with me? V visualize a cross and Jesus hanging on it. He's going to conquer two things. Hanging on that cross. He's going to conquer two things. Are you with me? You, you got a picture of a cross in your mind? You got Jesus hanging on it. Right. 
on one side of that cross, write the word sin, S-I-N. For when Christ died on the cross, he conquered sin. Past, present, and future, he conquered all sin. Agreed? You with me? Listen, listen. Here's what he says now. On the other side of the cross, write the word Satan, S-A-T-A-N, because he, he conquered them both. On the cross, he whipped them both, beat them both. That, that, he just told you that. Listen to what he said now. See, you miss this stuff. That through death, he might render powerless him who had the power of death. That is the devil. See, when you think death about your life, when you think about, oh, I wish I had that, that. death, that's the voice of Satan. Because if God speaks to your heart, he talks about life and life more abundant. Huh? John 10, 10, come on now. With that little voice, you know, you used to see a cartoon, they'd have the devil on one shoulder and the, and, and an angel on another. Yeah. Remember that? Don't be that person stuck in the middle. Listen, when, when that voice says to you, death, that's coming from Satan. When that voice speaks life and life more abundant, that's the Holy Spirit. Careful who talks to you. Careful who you give, in, who you give your inner dialogue to. Just be careful. Render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who through the fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. Don't let him pull that card on you. Not one more day when he pulls that card. Ah, you're going to die and then what's going to happen? Da, 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 da. Throw that life card on him. Because that's a, that's a life from the pit of hell. Let me tell you, it's all about the cross of Jesus Christ and his blood. Conquered both. Got that visual picture? Conquered sin and Satan. Revelation 2.10. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. He goes on to say, be faithful unto death and you'll receive the crown of Life. You don't get the crown of death. You get the crown of life at death. Don't fear death. Don't welcome it. And you should be all about life because you go from life to life. Death is a door from life to life. <laughs> Can't tell you how many times I told my wife that. You're about to step out of life into life. My, my, my. Mm. Peter would have presented a good question for Elijah. He would have asked Elijah out of 1 Peter 3, 13 through 15. He would have asked, who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? You know, he was always good. He was always saying, well, I'm zealous for God, but why are you running from him? <laughs> well, I'm running for my life so I can serve him. As long as you're running for your life, you'll never serve him. You got to stop and surrender it. <laughs> I'm just saying. You need to read this stuff. I put all this stuff down for you to read. You ought to read 1 Peter 3, 13 through 15. You ought to read 1 Corinthians 10, 11 through 13, where he says, no temptation or trial can overcome you. You have to surrender it. See, you always surrender something. Surrender to God. My, my, people, surrender to God. You ought to read 1 Peter 1, 6 through 8, and the fourth chapter, 12 through 19. 
Yeah. And pay attention to the word rejoice. In the midst of great suffering, can you rejoice? Can you rejoice? Well, you got to have something. You got to have something positive in your life moving for you to have joy, right? Joy and rejoice. Joy is the principle, is the doctrinal principle, and rejoice is the action of it. You know, it said the fruit of the Spirit is joy. You know what the reaction is? Rejoicing. Well, you ought to pay attention to the key words in the Greek. They'd help you. Beloved, don't be surprised by the fiery ordeals that you will go through. <laughs> but to whatever degree they are, always rejoice in the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? These are all found in 1 Peter. They're on your paper. Romans 8, 15 through 16, passage with sometimes we miss ideas in it. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery lead, leading to fear again. Now, interesting, the word again. You can always tell when you get in the world because the world will put fear in you. Well, how are you going to make your payment? How are you going to pay your bill? How are you going to do How are you going to? How are you going to? How are you going to? The answer is God, 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 God. You believe in logistical grace? You should because he'll teach it to you. He'll teach it in the most marvelous ways. You could write books on the way God will teach you. Listen, listen, Elijah could have wrote a book on how God fed him at the brook. Kishan couldn't he? Uh, ravens feeding, flying in food twice a day from the king's table. A raven. You know how difficult it is for a scavenger bird to keep good food in their, in their possession without eating it? on a long trip. I don't know what kind of a heart Elijah might have had at that point. Maybe a good one that would have fed him for their trip back. I don't know. They probably sat there and begged for it, though, don't you imagine? Then he sends, him, sends Elijah up to the widow, as Zarephath. He could have wrote a book on that one, Logistical Grace, and the list goes on. The book he wouldn't, he, he should write, he wouldn't, is lay, laying in a fetal position asking God to kill him under a juniper bush. <laughs> my, my, my. But you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry, Abba, Father. Why would you run from God when he's your heavenly father that wants to be on earth with you? He wants to be your Abba, Father. You know, that's a big deal to me. He adopted you so that he could be your Abba on earth, Father in heaven. Our Father who art in heaven, he's my Abba, my daddy down here. Never leave me anymore, forsake me, always take care of me, always sympathetic to what I'm going through, always caring about my needs, always caring about my needs. That's your Abba. It's not the, our God who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. No, he, I'm a father who cares about what you're going through. I care you got a headache today. I care about that. Okay? I, I don't know. Let me close. Eli, Elisha will be mentored by Elijah during the last years of Elijah's life. He will be preparing him as a mentor for the position of national prophet to lead a spiritual revelation, a reformation. Elijah has been assigned also, if you read, has been assigned the responsibility of preparing or mentoring young prophets for spiritual reformation. In 1985, I personally became engaged in mentoring in my own ministry life. Through the School of Biblical Theology, I have a ministry very similar and was led very similar to the life, through the study of the life of Elijah, <clears throat> to do the very thing that Elijah had been called to do. <clears throat> when I went through the book of Acts, 
As soon as I got that idea, I went through the book of Acts uh, to see it played out in the church. And I found it with Barnabas and Paul in Acts 11. Barnabas to Paul, then Paul to Timothy and Titus and to others. <clears throat> and as a result of that, God began to send me, after he put it in my heart, he began to send me young men in the ministry, young women in the ministry, older people in the ministry, people who didn't want to go to seminary, uh, people who wanted to be engaged in ministry that needed to be trained properly, to be mentored. And uh, we've been doing that. And I've, I'm very, I'm very uh, passionate about that ministry. Uh, and I first, I first got a hold of that idea when I did the life of Elijah 100 years ago. And uh, began to ask the Lord to show me exactly how it should be done. And, and, uh, and then he began to just send me people. And that's been going on since 1985. And, and it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a ministry in my heart. It's, it's, uh, I, can't, I can't imagine uh, not doing it any other way. And I feel the same way about the men who go through the training and women, anyone who wants to get into really good training uh, for ministry uh, of the church. Uh, I feel the same way that Paul, when Paul wrote to Timothy and Titus, he talked about them as my, my children of the faith, my, my son, my daughter, or whoever it might be, of the faith. These are people who are taking really serious the, the ministry idea of the Christian life. And listen, it's open to everybody. It's the School of Biblical Theology. Anybody can take this course. It's, it's if what, 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 you, what you learn in there is, is how to develop your life into ministry, how you develop your life into ministry. They're even advertising Greek class on uh, the Weather Channel now. So I like that. We're at uh, Ada now. We're at Ada. Right? Somewhere up in there. We went from Zeta to Ada. So we're... I'm almost tempted to try to get more hurricanes through so we could learn the alphabet, but... The other part of me says, no, let's skip that. Let's learn it another way. Uh, let's pray. And so our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for the life of Elijah, for the study of the life of Elijah. Uh, once again, Father, we see you are, your faithfulness to us is, is enormous. And uh, what, a wonderful, what a wonderful father you are to bench him and still play him, still part of the team. Not in a lead position anymore, but still a very vital role, a coaching place. Trying to prepare the younger ones. Jesus told Peter, that Satan had asked for and been given permission to sift him like wheat. That he would pray for his faith that it would not fail. And when he would come to a place of, of returning again to the faith, that he would have a great mentoring ministry of strengthening the brethren, the brethren. I pray for that message today, Father, to this church, to the church at large. We've got to come back to the, the gospel. We've got to come back to responsibility. We've got to come back to ambassadorship, priesthood work. 
We've got to teach, teach, teach. Everywhere we can. And live that life for Christ. Give testimony of our conversion and our growth. Encourage our hearts, Father, as a church. To be actively engaged in the communities around us. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.